Welcome all. Uh, my name is Peter Buckley. I am the Acting Dean of Humanities. And it's my great pleasure and honor to welcome everybody today to the Cooper Union for the advancement of science and art and to the inauguration of Laura Sparks as our 13th president. On behalf of Cooper Union faculty, I can be the first this morning to thank uh, Laura Sparks for her energy, her leadership, and her intelligence. And the, it's a way it's already bearing fruit in our historic institution and in our community. Now I'd like to ask you please to rise for the singing of the national anthem, which will be led by five members of the Cooper Tones, Olivia He Young Park, Anushri Shrida, Ava Gabrielson, Troy Coster, and Dennis Bergner. And now for the invocation, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Andrew Klein, uh, Rabbi Andrew Klein from Barrington, Rhode Island. Uh, he is uh, a rabbi at Temple Habunim. He's also a member of Laura's family, and we're delighted he could join us. Please stand. Good morning. As we stand here today in this great hall of the Cooper Union, our hearts are filled with gratitude for the bold and daring imagination of Peter Cooper, the founder of this union. We commit and recommit ourselves daily to working for the well being of this beloved institution, and we offer prayers of blessings and gratitude for the leadership of Cooper Union's 13th president, Laura Sparks. The theme of this celebratory week is truth. A belief in the sanctity of truth has breathed life into this sacred community for over a century and a half. That truth combines with a deep and inherent trust that this community has the will and the ability to collaborate with one another and create a shared vision for the future that is vibrant and illuminated. When we learn to live together in truth and build a sacred foundation of trust, the spark of transformation is ignited, a transformation that both shines with the brilliance of Cooper Union's illustrious history and joins with the bright and bold realities of today's world. We ask for blessings upon this sacred community, knowing that its journey, like all journeys, 
is filled with challenges. Challenges that can and surely will be met under the wise and thoughtful leadership of Laura Sparks. Laura, the gifts that you bring to the Cooper Union are legion. Your strength, courage, and determination. Your deep commitment to passionate public discourse. Your welcoming, warm heart your energy and passion to seek an all-inclusive truth, your willingness to pursue new ideas, your ability to speak honestly with integrity, and your capacity to listen with kindness and compassion. Laura, your indefatigable quest for equality and equal opportunity for everyone has found a worthy home here at the Cooper Union. Your task is huge, your charge is great, your heart and soul are open. In little over a year, you have demonstrated your readiness for this challenge to the Cooper Union community. And in turn, they have shown their openness to you and your collaborative style of leadership. As you step into this sacred task, we ask for blessings upon you and upon this community. May you continue to work well together. May you continue to seek truth in an atmosphere that fortifies the past and builds a future that is bold and daring. May you continue to build relationships worthy of respect and trust that lead to the ongoing transformation of this remarkable institution. Please be seated. Thank you, Rabbi Klein. Good morning, everyone. My name is Rachel Warren. I have the distinct honor of serving as chairman of the board of trustees of Cooper Union, and I now declare this inauguration open. My fellow trustees, distinguished guests, academic delegates, faculty, staff, students, alumni, partners, and friends, thank you very much for being here today. We are especially pleased to have with us Gail Brewer, Manhattan Borough President, Sheila Rodriguez, Director of Constituent Services representing Councilwoman Carlina Rivera's office, Damian Wetzel, Director of the Aspen Institute Arts Program, with whom we co-hosted an event last night, Richard Linzer, my predecessor as Cooper Board Chair, and three of Peter Cooper's descendants are also joining us here tonight, today, one of whom is Joe DeBroni, one of our trustees. We also welcome representatives from the New York State Attorney General's Office, John Aleski and Peggy Farber. Also joining us is Lee Islin, a great friend and benefactor of the Cooper Union and wife of the late John J. Islin, who was Cooper Union's 10th president. We welcome Laura's parents, Mary Lean and Steve Permit. Laura's father, Steve, joined the academic procession today, representing Temple University, as did Laura's father-in-law, Gil Sparks, the former chair of the board of the University of Delaware. Welcome to all of you. What a wonderful occasion for the community to celebrate together. In 1859, when Peter Cooper and his wife, Sarah, conveyed this building and the property on which it sits to create Cooper Union, he wrote a letter to the trustees. I was given a pocket version of that letter when I was elected chairman of the board, and I carry it around with me. Some people carry a pocket constitution. I carry Peter Cooper's letter. In that letter, Peter Cooper laid out his vision for Cooper Union as a place for our youth, for the working classes, and particularly notable for the time, for women to receive an education of the highest caliber. Peter Cooper's words continue to inspire all of us and they serve as a guide, a guidebook, if you will, that I and the board continue to rely upon today. When Laura was appointed president, I thought that I should get her a book, a guidebook, if you will, 
So I called one of those organizations that works with boards and trustees and presidents, and I got a very nice gentleman on the phone, and I said, I, I want to get a book for our newly elected president. Do you have such a book? Oh, he said, yes, we do. We have the perfect book. It was written by so-and-so, such-and-such, and, and it's the seminal book on presidential transitions. And that sounds great, I said, but I need a book with real life examples. Does it have that? Oh yes, he said. This is the seminal book on presidential transitions. I said, but we're a unique institution and we've had a rather tumultuous last few years. Do you have a book that covers that? <laughs> and he said very confidently, oh yes, yes we do. But I wasn't convinced. I need to be very clear with you, I said. Let me tell you a little bit about what makes us different. We are one of the country's oldest academic institutions. Since its founding nearly 160 years ago, we had been providing 100% full tuition scholarships to all of our students, regardless of need. A couple of years ago, after decades of structural deficits, the board made a difficult, but it thought necessary decision to charge tuition. Every student receives a minimum scholarship of 50%, and many students still attend for free, but not everyone. To many in our community, that decision breached the essential mission of our founder, Peter Cooper, to provide a free education to our students, and it breached the board's fiduciary duties. A lawsuit was filed against the trustees, and the, plaintiff, the plaintiffs included alumni, teachers, faculty, students. Our community was in disarray and it was severely fractured. We made headlines, but not in a good way. The New York State Attorney General's office intervened in the lawsuit and helped negotiate a settlement that resulted in a consent decree. We now have a shared governance system. Our board has two voting student trustees. A percentage of the trustees are elected by the Alumni Association. We have six faculty and staff representatives who observe our meetings. Oh, and we have a financial monitor who's been appointed and they attend every meeting, every committee meeting, every executive session, and they must approve all of our financial decisions. And, and there's one more thing. Um, for as long as we are charging tuition, the consent decree states that the board must always strive to return to a 100% scholarship model in a manner that's financially sustainable while maintaining our strong academic re reputation. And as I finished, I said, so, do you see what I mean? <laughs> We're unique. Now tell me, does this book, this seminal book on presidential transitions, does it cover these kinds of situations? And there was silence. <laughs> and this nice gentleman said very quietly, I'm sorry, ma'am, there's no book for that. <laughs> well, it's now been a little more than a year since Laura took office. Thankfully, luckily for us, Laura Sparks didn't need any book. Through the sheer force of her personality, her intellect and financial acumen, her compassion and wit, and most important, her patience and stamina, she has figured out how to partner this community back together again and to forge a path to a promising future. Laura has been an extraordinarily effective leader under extraordinarily challenging circumstances, and she's just getting started. When Laura and I began discussing the inauguration, we agreed that it should be privately funded. As many of you know, just three weeks ago, the board's free education committee issued a recommended plan to return to full scholarships. Fiscal prudence is one of the main tenets for the plan to be successful. Thanks to 100% participation from our current trustees above and beyond their usual gifts, and with some of our former trustees, close friends and business partners, we have covered all of the costs of this week's inaugural events. My thanks to all of you. We also agreed, Laura and I, to invite a special guest today 
who brings a different perspective than you might expect to hear at a presidential inauguration. John Oleski represented the New York State Attorney General's office in the lawsuit. John is dedicated to the success of Cooper Union, and we are so pleased that he agreed to be part of this ceremony, even though we haven't seen his remarks in advance. <laughs> But it gets even better than that. John will be introduced by Kevin Slavin and Mike Essel, two Cooper classmates, best friends, like brothers. Mike was one of the plaintiffs who brought the lawsuit. Kevin was one of the trustees who was sued. The lawsuit and the battle over tuition divided them. John Oleski's shuttle diplomacy brought them back together. And even more relevant to our purpose here today, after the lawsuit was settled, Kevin and Mike served together on the Presidential Search Committee, a group consisting of trustees, alumni, student, and faculty who unanimously recommended Laura as the president. Thank you to all the members of that committee. We've invited them here to join us on the stage today, and a particular thanks to the co-chairs, my fellow trustees, Eric Hershorn and Johnny Taylor, for their magnificent work in recommending Laura Sparks as our president. In planning the inauguration, Laura was clear that it should not focus solely on her, but rather that it should feature the school, its students, faculty, students, and alumni. So we asked three of our esteemed alumni to share their thoughts about Cooper Union with you, and you'll hear from them shortly. We also pulled a quote from that letter from Peter Cooper to the trustees that I mentioned. It's about the inspiration of truth, and we ask students and faculty from our schools of architecture, art, and engineering to interpret our founders' words through their work. You'll hear their thoughts this morning, too. And please note that their works, which can be seen both in the programs that you have, as well as in the colonnade windows at the street level upstairs. So let's get started. Following me now to the podium will be four guests who each have a few words to share about Laura. They represent her academic journey from Wellesley College to the University of Pennsylvania, and now here to the Cooper Union. We'll hear from Andrew Shannon, Provost of Wellesley College, Wendell Pritchett, Provost of the University of Pennsylvania, who will be joining us by video, Michael Fitz, who serves as the president of Tulane University, but he's the former dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and Paul Nicolin, president of the Cooper Union Alumni Association and a member of the Board of Trustees. Andrew? Thank you, Rachel, and good morning, everyone. It is a huge honor and pleasure to bring greetings to this gathering from President Sparks and the graduate alma mater. Wellesley College is immensely proud of Laura's appointment as your first woman president, and grateful to have this new link with an institution that is dedicated to so many of the same values that we at Wellesley hold most dear. The Cooper Union and Wellesley were founded a decade apart by two men and a woman who shared a common sense of urgency about addressing growing social inequality in mid-19th century America, and who viewed education as the means to a more just and inclusive society. Although Wellesley's mission was and is focused specifically on the education of women, our founders shared with Peter Cooper a visionary commitment to broadening opportunity for all deserving students, whatever their means. I know that the Cooper Union continues to be animated by your founding principles. I've read with admiration the messages that President Sparks has issued over the past year as this community has stepped up to defend long-standing values of truth-seeking and access to educational opportunity in a time of obscurantism and exclusion. Of all the many statements issued by university presidents in defense of darker dreamers, None has stated the case more plainly and powerfully than your new president. I hope you'll forgive my expressing a little collegiate pride on this happy occasion. Wellesley College is always proud 
never surprised to see one of our graduates assuming a role that no woman has ever held before. Laura, your appointment almost coincided with another of your Wellesley sisters almost breaking the biggest glass ceiling of them all. <laughs> that day will come. In the meantime, each of these individual breakthroughs, whoever makes it, whatever her college, marks important progress towards gender equity in our society. And at the same time, each inspires us to broaden our understanding of equity to encompass other dimensions of exclusion and access. We're also proud of the impact that Wellesley's educational philosophy had on Laura. Careers of purpose and accomplishment often begin with moments of intellectual discovery and self-discovery. Laura's course was set by first-year courses in moral philosophy and macroeconomics that challenged her to reconcile the ethical imperatives of social and economic justice with the operation of a free market. A liberal arts education surfaces the unresolved questions and prepares students for a lifetime of addressing them. When Laura was a student at Wellesley, her president was a woman called Diana Chapman Walsh. One of Diana's favorite quotations, as Laura may recall, came from the poet Rilke, who said this, be patient toward all that is unsolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves like locked rooms and like books that are now written in a very foreign tongue. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, live into the answer. The ethical questions that Laura encountered in her philosophy major at Wellesley College have clearly influenced her life and career in a profound way. She has lived the question and she has helped institutions and communities live into the answer. I have no doubt that she will help this institution explore its own questions and live into its own answers. Congratulations, President Sparks. Congratulations to all the students, faculty, staff, graduates, friends, and trustees of this great and unique place. Thank you. bring greetings from the University of Pennsylvania, where Laura earned not one, but two graduate degrees. Incidentally, I have only one Penn degree, so maybe that explains why she's about to become president and I'm only a provost. In all seriousness, I'm thrilled and honored to congratulate Laura and to congratulate the Cooper Union on a very, very wise choice for its new leader. At Penn Law, Laura was my student. In fact, she was a student in the very first class I taught there, housing law. At the time, she was also in the process of getting her MBA at Wharton. I know what you're thinking, wow, what a slacker. Even among a group of very bright and highly motivated law students who themselves have met with great success, Laura stood out. She was mature beyond her years, and she was precise and purposeful both in thinking and argument. But that's not all. Have you ever encountered someone who makes you want to stand just a little straighter and think a little harder when you meet them? Someone who elevates the discussion just by being in the room? For me, that was Laura. And never worried that she hadn't prepared enough for class. Under her rigorous questioning, I worried that I hadn't. She pushed me and her classmates not simply to do better, but to be better. Not just to acquire knowledge, but to continue to learn and question uh, what we thought we knew. And that is exactly what she has done over the course of her extraordinary career. Now at this point, you may be wondering what kind of law I thought more, Laura might practice. Housing, corporate, environmental. In fact, and spoiler alert, this is something I never told her, I didn't think she practiced law at all. I knew she was destined to make a large social impact. I knew she would be a leader, and I love being right. When I learned that the Cooper Union had selected Laura as president, as its first woman president, I wasn't surprised in the least. But I did have a question. What in the world took so long? Chair Warren, members of the Board of Trustees, and honored guests, please join me in congratulating the Cooper Union's 13th president, Laura Sparks.
What a wonderful occasion, what a wonderful moment. Welcome and good morning. I'm Mike Fitz, president of Tulane University and formerly dean of the University of Pennsylvania Law School where Laura Sparks is one of our most distinguished graduates. To the esteemed and dedicated members of the Cooper Union community, faculty, staff, students, alumni, and all those gathered to celebrate the installation of Laura Sparks as the 13th president of Cooper Union, I'm honored and delighted to join you in the celebration today. When universities choose a president, it's a moment of serious self-reflection. They stop and make a thoughtful choice about their future. They determine how they want to be led and who they want to be. In Laura Sparks, Cooper Union has chosen somebody who embodies everything that makes this institution extraordinary. And let me just say, you have chosen well. The daughter of an immigrant, Laura is a woman who has carved her own unique path through life. Instead of becoming a doctor like her father, as she originally intended, she chose to study philosophy, as we've heard. Instead of jumping right into pa her passion of community development, she spent time sharpening her financial chops at Goldman Sachs. And instead of forging the traditional path to university presidency through academia, spending years combing through dusty library archives, she blazed a trail through the world of philanthropy, tirelessly applying her skills to improve the human condition and to make the world better. Universities are incredibly complex machines, entangled in politics, philosophy, and finances. And Cooper Union is the paradigmatic example of that. <laughs> it takes a skilled conductor to turn these disparate elements into a symphony. This pragmatic and poetic touch is what makes presidents great. And in Laura, you've chosen an individual who we've heard with both financial brilliance and emotional intelligence, the mind and the heart, a rare and valuable combination that will serve Cooper Union well. One thing I have long admired about this historic institution is how its mission is so clearly stated in its full name, the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Not just science and not just art, both together. It reminds me of Walter Isaacson's astute observation in his biography of Stephen Jobs. He wrote, the future of innovation will come from people who are able to link beauty to engineering, humanity to technology, and poetry to processors. At their best, universities are engines of opportunity and progress, fueled by the kind of innovation Walter describes. Because bringing together experts from diverse backgrounds, fields, and perspectives promotes intellectual curiosity, the lifeblood of education. And with that curiosity, universities forge ideas, systems, and new ways of thinking to solve difficult problems and shape the future of the world. Laura Sparks is exactly that kind of innovator. She's an entire team of experts embodied in one person. She wields a Swiss army knife of expertise. Law, business, philosophy, economics, and as I say, emotional intelligence thrown in. She views the world through an academic kaleidoscope, and she sees, therefore, the answers others cannot. At her core, Laura is the ultimate problem solver. And since the job of president involves an almost hourly procession of complicated and often quite eccentric problems, she fits in perfectly. I'm not surprised that you chose Laura as president because Cooper Union has spent its entire 159-year history taking on the world's toughest problems, from slavery to suffrage. Most of all, this institution embodies a passionate commitment to building opportunity. For Cooper Ewing, having Laura Sparks at the helms means having a leader who has applied that same focus over her entire career across the public, private, and civic fears. And when one talks to Laura, it is clear to me that she both understands and believes in this essential promise of Cooper Union, to be a place that opens its doors to those who dream of changing the world 
and she relishes in the chance to advance your noble mission. Today is also especially emotional to see a friend take the helm of this great institution because Cooper Union and all it represents matters a great deal to me personally. My wife's father, Albert, graduated from Cooper Union in 1930. Albert immigrated to the United States from Hungary when he was 17 years old. Armed with only a high school level education, Albert worked on an assembly line in a factory in Brooklyn to support his parents and brother. For many immigrants like Albert, the story might begin and end in that very factory. But Albert's luck changed when he heard about Cooper Union, a school that did not demand transcripts from his high school, which he could not get from the old country, and which would admit him based on his passing an entrance exam. Best of all, if he could get in, he would not have to pay any tuition. So Albert took the exam and prayed for the rest. A few months later, he received his letter of acceptance. His brother, running across the factory floor, deliver him the news. He entered Cooper Union the following semester, taking night classes so he could continue to support his family at the factory, and eventually he graduated with a Bachelor of Chemical Engineering. And here's what it means to the world when you provide promising young students that type of opportunity. Albert went on to earn his Master's in Chemistry from Columbia and a PhD from Brooklyn Polytechnic. He became a scientist who pioneered the modern clinical treatment of infants. In my family, we've always considered Cooper Union a magical place, one that wholly embodies the American dream. And I know how proud Albert would have been to see Laura, the daughter of an immigrant like him, lead his beloved alma mater into the future. There is no one better to lead an institution which is, at its core, about opportunity. The opportunity to learn, to grow, to create, to discover, to change, and most of all, to be the very best version of yourself. Congratulations, Laura, and congratulations, Cooper Union. You're a perfect fit. Thank you. Good morning. I first heard about our new president, Laura Sparks, by way of some chit chat among alumni. How fantastic she is, how excited everybody was. I first met Laura when I visited her during office hours. I was impressed that she would take the time to meet with any member of our community, while she obviously had a lot to do and a ton of pressure. During our meeting, I was moved. After voicing my concerns about Cooper Union and complaining for a bit, I was relieved to find out that I and Cooper Union had a true ally with our best interests in mind. I've now had the privilege of working closely with Laura over the past eight months. I could speak for quite some time about her intelligence, commitment, and dedication to our school. <coughs> However, I only have a little time, so I offer the following. As an alumnus of the Cooper Union, president of the Alumni Association, and a trustee, I'm honored to welcome Laura into our Cooper community. We are fortunate to be brought into an exciting new chapter by this accomplished, talented, and passionate leader. Since day one, actually since before day one, Laura has worked to understand and embrace Peter Cooper's founding vision, the legacy established over the past 150 plus years, and the sentiments and passions of the present community, among them students, alumni, faculty, staff, and our neighbors in New York City. Laura cares deeply, and that is essential. We welcome you, Laura, to our Cooper family. Thank you. Hello. I'm Mike Essel, a 1996 graduate of the School of Art and the Dean of the Art School. And this is Kevin Slavin, a 1995 graduate and an alumni trustee. A couple of years ago, we both agreed things needed to change. That is an understatement. We did, but we agreed on that. <laughs> Kevin thought we changed things via culture, that you didn't need to change structure, that the problems stemmed from the culture of the people who had taken us down a path 
that made sense to them. Kevin joined the board as an alumni trustee. I said the problem is structure, regardless of culture, that the problems stem from a few people with the capability to do so much damage. I co-founded the Committee to Save Cooper Union with Toby and Adrian and sued the Board of Trustees. History has proved us both right. So there's a, <clears throat> there's a, a story here about um, different approaches to a problem. And in this story, um, Mike plays the uh, unstoppable force and I play the immovable object. <laughs> Um, uh, and in this story, uh, as in a lot of other stories that you may or may not ever hear about, um, there was also uh, John Oleski uh, uh, from the state of New York uh, who plays the adult in the room, um, whatever, <laughs> whatever room that is. Um, and when we, were, when we were setting up the presidential search committee, um, I, I proposed and sort of demanded that instead of having um, students and alumni as observers that they actually vote, uh, that they actually vote for the president. And it, it meant that we took this unprecedented and really weird step of having uh, a student vote for the president of the college that they were in. Um, that's a little weird and uh, that student should probably hate us uh, because what it ended up, what that means is interviewing, let's say about 100 people. Um, which we did. And it was obvious when we, more or less, uh, uh, after we first started to really spend a little time with Laura, that uh, Laura was really the person that you would want to bring home uh, to your family. Um, <laughs> and uh, by family, I mean this one. Um, uh, and now this, uh, this is her home. And Mike is still my family. Uh, <laughs> and I love him more than anybody knows except maybe Mike. Uh, and um, as surely as Cooper divided us, it also brought us together. And if an institution can do both of those things, that means it's not just the institution, it's actually the leadership uh, within that. Um, and that, uh, that leadership is what we're here to really uh, speak to and celebrate today. Uh, and the woman who really represents and embodies the changes that we all agreed uh, needed to happen. So thank you, Mike, thank you, thank you Laura, and thank you, John. Uh, Thank you to John for bringing us and everyone together and for fighting for the Cooper Union. Please join us in welcoming John Oleski. Boy, it's hard to see from here. Um, uh, it's, of course, my uh, distinct uh, privilege uh, to join you on behalf of Attorney General uh, Eric Schneiderman and the uh, hundreds of very talented and dedicated uh, public servants that I am fortunate enough to call my colleagues uh, and my friends. I can only hope uh, that what I have to share with you uh, does justice uh, to the example uh, they set for me every day uh, and the spirit of collaboration and support um, that is the lifeblood of our office. Um, and I'm, I'm of course uh, humbled by uh, appearing on uh, this platform um, uh, where uh, so much uh, has been done uh, for so long, uh, and it's it's uh, it's humbling. It's also uh, a bit uh, intimidating. Um, you know, uh, Lincoln was here, or I, I understand he was over there actually. Um, uh, but but you know, um, can, can anything that we do match up with uh, the people uh, who have graced this platform? Um, and I think it's it's altogether uh, fitting uh, that. Uh, the board and, and President Sparks have chosen uh, truth as the theme uh, for this week and for this celebration uh, because, you know, for all that I came to understand about Peter Cooper and his times and this institution uh, and its role, um, it has become more and more clear and, and perhaps only uh, snapped into focus uh, with this opportunity that what Cooper really did uh, and, and the people uh, who, who worked with him um, and joined him um, was, you know, the beginning of our country and perhaps our, you know, human civilization maturing to the point of knowing that progress could only come uh, if people were actually willing to look in the mirror and face the reality of the world as it is and to deal uh, with the contrast between our principles uh, and the things that we want uh, for ourselves and our children and our country, our neighbors, uh, and 
what actually goes on in our lives. Um, and obviously that's a, a work in progress and a work that will never be finished. Um, and I, I do want to, to thank Mike and Kevin um, and Rachel and everyone else who I've met here at the Cooper Union. Um, and I obviously, on a personal level, very much appreciate uh, the words of, of thanks. Um, but the fact is that this is just, you know, my, my small part in what's happened at Cooper Union is my job. Um, and it, it may be um, perhaps uh, a troubling sign of where we are today that it should seem in any way extraordinary uh, that we should be able to count uh, on government officials uh, diligently attempting uh, to help the people that they are charged uh, with helping. Um, but the fact is um, uh, that there are uh, right now uh, hundreds, thousands uh, of other public servants who aren't getting to give a speech and um, don't have the, the good fortune of my particular circumstance, um, who are saving lives um, for very little money or, or taking money out of their pockets um, for supplies for uh, the children uh, in their classes who can't afford it for themselves. And so uh, to the extent that uh, any part of this is an appreciation directed at myself personally, or really more broadly at our office, which I, I like to think we try to do our job here, um, that there, there's other ways in which um, I think you could support the idea of appreciating um, the, the sacrifices made by uh, much more worthy public servants than myself or, or even with uh, the people maybe who I get to work with every day uh, in an office building. Um, the fact is that Cooper Union is still here. Cooper Union is alive not just as an engineering, art, and architecture school, not just still alive as some shell. Cooper Union is still alive as the vehicle for what Peter Cooper bequeathed to this state and this country 150 years ago. And it's alive not because I or anyone at my office did our jobs, but because of a lot of people whose job it wasn't. Um, decided to dedicate their time uh, and their effort uh, to a noble purpose. Um, it wasn't Mike's job. Mike was a teacher. Um, he just wanted to teach. Uh, and it was reasonable to expect that he could just teach, but he couldn't. Um, uh, Kevin, uh, I understand, has his own uh, professional life and business. Um, it was not his job uh, to volunteer uh, endless hours uh, to try to keep uh, the people that this institution depended on uh, working together, uh, which he did. Um, this was not Rachel Warren's job. Right? And, and all of these people who are on this board of trustees um, who have managed since the settlement of the lawsuit um, to get us to where you are all today, these are all volunteers. None of these people are paid. Um, every minute that Rachel or anyone else on the board, anyone on the faculty or the staff, any of the alumni, any of the students, um, you know, spend uh, in, in their time uh, to try to work towards uh, making this place uh, what they think it can and should be is time they're taking away from their families or their professions, that they are sacrificing um, for this. And to me, um, that has been uh, the greatest lesson of this entire experience uh, has been a validation, um, you know, that it is important to look at the truth, to face reality. That is part of why um, the consent decree happened and the settlement happened. Um, but there's also uh, certain underlying truths um, that, that can't be tested or proven, uh, like the basic concept that uh, this isn't going to work. Nothing's going to work if people can't just work together. Um, and, and so it's not about me or really about Mike or Kevin or Rachel or anyone else I could name. I mean, I wish I knew more of the people I'd gotten to know, more of the people in the alumni or the students or the, the, the broad community of support that, that Cooper has so I could tell you about this person or that person and how they inspired uh, me with their example and all of this. But there's also a danger there of talking about the individuals and what they did um, and how we or owe things uh, to them. Um, there's a danger because uh, obviously it was, it was a lot more than just a, a few individuals who made this happen. Um, without the, 
all of the students uh, who uh, voiced their opinions, all the alumni, uh, the faculty, members of the board. It, it, without everybody, it, it couldn't have happened. Um, and it, it seems like a, a peculiar situation because this is an institution so steeped in the memory of one person. Uh, it's named after that person. And I came to know so much, I think, about Peter Cooper, at least what you could learn from, from books, um, during this process. And I came here, um, you know, when I first uh, was asked to come, thinking, oh, I've got my, you know, my best Cooper stuff. I can, I can tell them all the neat facts about you know, how Cooper was ahead of his time in this way or that. Um, and of course he was, of course he has lessons for us. I mean, there's the apocryphal story of the, the, the ele elevator shaft in this building that for a long time um, I understood was built kind of like on a dream that elevators would be invented and he, he knew this in advance. But the fact is that, that one had been opened 10 blocks away uh, 10 years earlier and Peter Cooper knew this and that's why he built the elevator shaft. Um, and you know, the, the fact that uh, you know, um, Peter Cooper had a lot of uh, really um, uh, uh, aggressive dreams. Uh, he wanted this to be uh, one of the best polytechnic schools in the world. And of course it is, um, but of course it never was during his lifetime. Um, but the fact is that Peter Cooper is not going to show up to fix any of the issues that the Cooper Union still needs to work on or to, to figure out for you how to fulfill his vision if that's something that you or we uh, think is something noble and worthy. Um, I, I, I feel Rachel's carrying uh, Cooper's letter in her pocket, but the fact is the answers are not there either. Um, the answers are not in any person uh, now or in the past. Um, and the fact is, if, you put, if we put our reliance on one person uh, or, or one set of writings, um, uh, we risk being disappointed when we are faced with the truth, the reality that no one is perfect, and that, that there's, there's always some kind of compromise in human affairs. Um, and I, I'm loath to say this, but we're here to celebrate the truth. The fact is that uh, for the first 40 years of Cooper's existence, it didn't have the Chrysler building. Um, it wasn't given that gift yet. Uh, and it was largely uh, surviving on the um, largesse of Cooper himself and his relatives. Uh, Cooper would pay for the school's deficits out of his pocket. And um, the fact is that Cooper did not make his money um, in what was then or now a particularly uh, progressive or satisfying way, perhaps. He owned the largest glue factory in the country in Brooklyn. Uh, he made glue. Um, and you can imagine that making glue in 1855 was not, not pretty. Um, and uh, the Newtown Creek turned into a gelatinous solid. Um, and uh, after Peter's, uh, Cooper's family closed the glue factory, they moved it to a, a town in western New York next to a, a Native American reservation. Um, and um, in that town is now the site of the Peter Cooper Superfund site. So I, I, I don't say these things in any way um, to, to try to <laughs> denigrate the memory of Cooper. <laughs> I say these things to recognize the truth that Peter Cooper was just a man. And he was just a man with some really good ideas that can inspire us. But he can't do it for us now. No one can and no one else can do the things that are our charge to do. Um, and, and there's a similar danger with this kind of hero worship um, I think with the idea that only certain moments in time count and that once we, we get there, like for example, the consent decree, once, once we get that solved, everything will be good. Once the next election happens, justice will prevail. Once, once the next board meeting happens and, and I really get to express, my, that's when the turning point will come. And the fact is um, that both the hero worship and maybe the kind of moment worship um, are an easy way to obscure the reality the truth um, that there's never going to be the end. It's always just going to be a slog every day to do a little bit and hope it gets better and, and, and hope that today's not the day where all the work that we did over the last year gets set back by a year, but oh well, that might happen too. And the only thing to do the next day is to get up and try again. Um, I. I spoke to the Attorney General um, after the Free Education Committee report was first released, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment, um, and after uh, the school had adopted its new uh, mission and value statement, 
And, um, you know, he said to me that, to him, the story of Cooper is that the work that we're doing has to be about more than just preventing people or catching people, breaking the law, um, you know, tearing down bad things. It has to be about building something and, and making it possible for people of goodwill to build things together. Um, and, and it reminded me of this situation and uh, of uh, one of my favorite quotes from, from Robert Kennedy from a speech he gave 50 years ago in South Africa uh, was that it's, it's from numberless and diverse uh, uh, acts of courage and belief uh, that shape human history. And that every time someone stands up uh, for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others uh, or strikes out against an injustice, they send forward a tiny ripple of hope and coming together from a million centers of energy uh, and, and belief, um, these ripples build a current that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. And that's the truth of where we are, um, is that uh, while we're here to celebrate the inauguration of Laura Sparks, she can't do it all by herself. You can't count on my office to do it. You can't count on anyone on this stage to do it. Um, no one can do the things that you could do uh, tomorrow or the next day, and that's the very hard reality, isn't it, that we all have to face. Um, that uh, after the big victory or uh, you know, the, the, the key moment, uh, you still have to show up and talk to people the next day and try to work with other people uh, to get things done. And I just want to tell one story about that in this instance. Um, you know, part of this process was for everyone, I think, uh, the very difficult business of being able to trust uh, other people. And that's, that's the hardest work of that everyday slog is, is being able to trust yourself that you have something to offer and trust that the people you're working with um, are, are driven by the same values and that even if you don't agree that you can work together. Um, and I think everyone in this process had a very hard time letting go of their deep distrust. Um, and that was very understandable under the circumstances. And uh, I recall um, my last conversation with another one of the people whose job it wasn't, and who, if anyone saved the school, um, it, it was them among others. My last conversation with uh, the late Adrian Jovanovic, um, your former trustee, uh, was, I believe, um, the night before uh, the board met to elect uh, Laura Sparks. Now, I did not know uh, who the candidates were uh, for the presidency. Um, part of what, what our office had done and believed was right uh, was we did our job and made it possible for, we hoped, there to be a structure where the board could do its job and we were going to let the board do its job. Um, and so I knew nothing about the candidates. Um, but I had spoken with Adrian several times and I knew that he had concerns about, you know, the whole process of how, uh, you know, were things moving fast enough um, was everyone really on the same page? Could he trust was the underlying question. Uh, and I spoke to him and I, I said, look, um, Adrian, if, if you have any question that the person uh, that, that you're being asked to vote on is not the best person you think you're gonna find to deal with this situation, and we both know what this situation is. Um, if you don't think this is a person of uh, the highest integrity um, with uh, the, the the best set of skills that the school uh, has been able to find in the course of this process, then you should vote against them. Um, that's your job as a trustee, if you think that's right. Um, but if this is about trust, if this is about um, you know, not being sure uh, that you can let it go, um, even if you believe that it's the right person, well, that's the hard part of the work here. And I told him, you know, it was, it was not so easy for us at the office to say, okay, um, we're gonna trust that, that you guys can do this because it's your job. And I said, you know, if, if this is the right candidate, um, at some point you're going to have to decide that you're ready to trust uh, and you're ready to, to believe that other people um, uh, can do uh, what they can do. And uh, I didn't know what was gonna happen. Uh, and then the next day I found out uh, that uh, Laura Sparks had been unanimously elected uh, by the Board of Trustees. Um, 
And uh, I have to say, you know, it's, we're now having this inauguration some, I guess, a year or so after uh, Laura actually became the president of the school, which maybe is an instructive example uh, for how perhaps we should uh, govern our expectations of these things. Um, certainly in this case, uh, it has turned out to be um, uh, uh, a demonstration that has allowed our office to be in the position, while we can't comment, and I'll get to that on the Free Education Committee report, um, you know, if we knew nothing about uh, President Sparks, uh, I don't think I'd have much to say here. It would be inappropriate for me to guess uh, or to give any kind of uh, hope uh, without facts, without truth to rely on. But the fact is, we have the happenstance uh, that President Sparks um, has been doing this job for a year, and in that time, um, it has been remarkable. Uh, to see how quickly and how universally the community uh, seems to react to her style of leadership. Um, she has, in her communications with our office, uh, been uniformly, not just transparent, but eager, proactive in uh, seeking our help and support in solving the really tough problems. Uh, and from what I have seen um, and had the privilege of seeing when President Sparks has uh, taken questions from the community and tried to, to resolve people's concerns, uh, I, I've seen that you know, she, she's not always gonna have the answer, um, but she has, uh, at least from what I have seen, uh, always um, uh, given you the truth. Uh, and I think that's really all you can ask for right now. Um, and, and so uh, just uh, about the Free Education Committee report, it did just come out. Um, there's a process in which the financial monitor is to review and comment uh, and then report to our office. And it's not until that time that we're gonna be able to make any judgments about whether or not um, what the school and President Sparks over the last year um, seem to have accomplished, which is at least to put together a plan. Um, I will tell you that when I became involved in this, the idea that the school would have a plan to return to free education in 10 years would have seemed like a fantasy. Um, and at this point, I'll be honest that I'm, I, I think, still healthily skeptical, um, but our office won't have any determinations until after we see the, the financial monitor's report. Um, uh, I will say this, um, you know, the whole point of this, as the Attorney General said, is to build something and to build it to last. Uh, and so, of course, after what's happened, there's obvious reason for everyone to want to fix it now, um, for this to be the moment. And for the moment where we've achieved justice and fixed everything to be passed, and we can say we did it, we won. Um, and I guess I don't have an expectation that it's going to be that simple, um, even if uh, there is a plan and a good one uh, that has the chance of getting the school back to free in 10 years, the fact that the plan exists doesn't, isn't gonna do all the hard work over the next 10 years that might make that happen. Um, and so I thank you for the opportunity to be here and to speak. I'm sorry if it's a little untraditional because it's not our role to tell you that your president is great and she's going to do a good job. It's our, it's our job to supervise and, and see how she does. Um, but so far, so good. Um, so, thank you. Um, good luck, President Sparks. Uh, good luck to all of you. Um, we're all going to need uh, all of that uh, support and mutual encouragement and understanding um, if we're going to be able to face reality and truth, uh, which is not always easy, uh, but the truth is it's the only way. So thank you very much. Michael Young, 
I'm an assistant professor in the Erwin S. Chanin School of Architecture. I'm Mira. I'm a fourth year architecture student at the Cooper Union. I would love to just hear more about the project, why you decided to base the project on the elevator. So the project was done by myself, uh, Mira, and an alumni, uh, Daniel Wills. There's this iconic image of the elevator core under construction, a kind of metaphor for the Cooper Union being something that is always taking chances and risks. What we were looking for was for the three different architects to do three different projects from the same origin. Daniel Wills digitally modeled the entire foundation building and then cut section cuts to begin to expose this core within a core within a core. The approach I decided to take was inspired by a collage method called rollage. Uh, I wanted to somehow capture that fact that it is more than an object, that it's actually an atmosphere, a vibration that extends throughout the Cooper Union. In the drawings that I've presented, it, it juxtaposes the architectural detail to the architectural whole. The building's core is as important as the detail. So one of the things that design can do is hide what's underneath. And the other thing that it can do is expose what's underneath. I'm curious how you think about that role of design in the context of the Cooper Union. Part of what good design, good architecture does is not only put a mirror up to reflect the way in which we understand what is around us, but also hopefully navigates and probes a little deeper to see what are the things that we haven't yet actually realized are going on around us. You know, to see all the architecture students in one studio working on their individual projects and collaborating with each other to push each other in their own work, for me, has been really powerful. I'm curious um, what that experience has meant for you, how it's shaped your work. My process has changed exponentially since I've joined the Cooper Union. The lower years have influenced my work, just passing by their desks and looking at their models or what material they're using influences my process. It's the kind of thing that you hope a school always has. It's not siloed, it's not segmented, it's not put in these rooms and different buildings in different places, together, working on architecture. Ladies and gentlemen, students, faculty, members of the Board of Trustees, Madam President. My name is Nader Tehrani, and it's an honor to be serving as the Dean of the Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture. It's hard to believe one year has passed so quickly and how we've yet to inaugurate or still in the process of this important historical passage. I cannot amply express what a pleasure it's been to join the Cooper community, and even more so, to be part of what promises to be a very important transformation of this institution, at once rediscovering its core values, but also in interpreting them towards future challenges. The realism of some of the other talks suggests those challenges are real. In this short period, President Sparks has always, has already established a dialogue that is salient combination of discipline, warmth, and ambition, all wrapped together in a direct and candid conversation with students, faculty, and administration. She's listened, but she's already interpreted this culture with great generosity. The Irwin S. Channon School of Architecture is a central part of this culture, producing extraordinary architects but above all, great citizens, visionaries, and entrepreneurs. Jean Brownhill is one such exemplary person, and it's been a pleasure to get to know over the past couple of years. She embodies all that is great about Cooper education, taking great strides to develop a project beyond architecture towards unscripted and unanticipated futures. Welcome back, Jean. It's a great pleasure to share this stage with you.
I'm not Jean. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you, Nadir, and welcome to everyone this morning, honored guests, delegates, faculty and staff, alumni, and friends of the Cooper Union, family, and friends of our president, Laura Sparks. I'm Elizabeth O'Donnell, Associate Dean of the School of Architecture and a proud and grateful alumna of the school. It is my great pleasure to join in introducing our speaker, Jean Brownhill, School of Ar Architecture Class of 2000. Jean's accomplishments following her commencement from this very stage have been many and remarkable as she has sought to analyze, systematize, and then completely reimagine the means by which people who need and could benefit from architecture can connect with those who design it and make it in a shared creative project. Jean and I had our first conversation in her first year review, and we have been in contact ever since. As alumni of the school, Jean and I will always share something quite remarkable. At Cooper, we had a common experience. We shared many common experiences and even teachers. But most importantly, for five years we each shared, though at different times, a room, the big studio and the foundation building, where faculty and students have come together across decades to study and make architecture. The big studio is still a place for work and debate, a space of thoughts, of speculation, and creative exploration. The making of such a space, year after year, has always been a critical part of the education of architects at Cooper. In December 2011, Jean called me with a project. She had been invited to apply for the Loeb Fellowship at Harvard, one of the most prestigious awards in our discipline, and she asked me to be one of her references. Jean had just launched Sweeten, her startup, her invention, her creative project, and I had no doubt at all that if Jean were to get into the room with the Loeb Committee, she would get that fellowship. But I needed to do my part towards getting her into that room, towards opening the door through a constructed letter. Once opened, I was certain that Jean could transform whatever room she entered into a space of thought, debate, and creative exploration, as we each learned through our work in the big studio, and as she has done in many different rooms in the years that have followed her work here. It gives me great pleasure to welcome activist, entrepreneur, architect, and 2012 Loeb Fellow, Jean Brownhill, to the podium for this inaugural celebration. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jean Tarani and Elizabeth. I'm thrilled be part of the celebrations today. Uh, when I started at the architecture school here, I was a poor brown girl from New London, Connecticut. I was 18 years old, and I could count on one hand how many times I had been to New York City. Now, my mother is in the audience, which is very hard to see because it's very bright, um, but she probably is saying how much she hates when I say that we were poor when I remind her of some of the indignities, like push starting our car in the rain and in the snow, she simply brushes me off. For those of you who are not familiar with push starting a car, uh, it, it involved us putting our red Toyota Tercel hatchback into neutral, and then my mother and I would push the front bumper so it would roll out of the driveway, and then once in the street, my mother would get into the driver's seat and I would be left to push the car from behind. I would push as hard and as fast as I could towards the little hill at the end of our street. When it worked, the car gained enough momentum to roll down the hill, eventually bucking backwards, a sign that the starter had turned over, and then the motor, as if by magic, would be on. And I would run down the hill and jump into that running car. Now, when I remind my mother of this, she says, yes, Jean, that's true. But, she correctly points out, one, we had a car. <laughs> and two, how fortunate we were to live at the top of a hill. <laughs> 
My mother showed this same optimism when she learned about the Cooper Union. She was convinced that I would get in. Now, I, um, I was an okay student. I have dyslexia. I worked very hard, but I was not as sure as she was. But since we had no money save for me to go to college and Cooper Union was free, I went for it. And fortunately, I got in. And once here, I thrived. Now, of course, there was some doubt in the beginning, like the months that I was convinced that they had made a mistake and they were going to figure it out and someone was going like, to drag me out of here. <laughs> but once I realized you know, that I did belong here, I thrived. Before Cooper, I had only waitressed, cleaned houses, or babysat. And I could never afford to take an unpaid internship while I was here. Elizabeth O'Donnell didn't mention, but she also gave me my very first office job. After graduating with a degree from the architecture school and with my training from Elizabeth, I was set up for other office jobs. And because I had little debt, I felt free to experiment with many different professional opportunities. I did go on to win the prestigious Loeb Fellowship from Harvard Graduate School of Design, and I do now run my own company, which is kind of like trying to build a car and start it and push it uphill all at the same time, but that's another story. Um, my award-winning team at Sweeten, Sweeten is like home sweet home, they connect great general contractors and architects with residential and construction projects. And those projects now total close to a billion dollars of construction. I have raised millions of dollars of uh, venture capital. We have helped thousands of people create a space that they love. And I have employed hundreds of people to make it happen. Now I share this not to brag, although I really am so proud of my accomplishments. I share it as an example of what can happen when you support a student with a background like mine. Now, obviously, Peter Cooper didn't know me, but he did have a vision of me, a smart, hardworking student with the desire to change people's life for the better and the untapped capacity to achieve that goal. I also share it as a powerful example of the vision that Peter Cooper had of the school as a beacon of light, not just for kids from disadvantaged backgrounds like mine, but for students all around the world looking for academic excellence and experiences that cannot be bought. Now, with all that context about me, <laughs> I hope you understand why I am so deeply honored to join you today in the inauguration of President Laura Sparb. If I may be so bold and try to speak for the past, the current, and the future students of the Cooper Union, we have had a vision of you, President Sparks. We had a vision of someone, a tenacious and brilliant leader, someone ready to speak truth to power, willing to engage the community and communicate the unique and critical role that this school plays within this city and within the academic world and someone able to put the systems in place to fund our future. President Sparks, you are an incredible woman, a strong community leader, and a champion of both diversity and excellence, two things that are not, in fact, in conflict, no matter what our current national conversation argues. President Sparks once said that the trajectory of her career has been marshalling critical resources and smart thinking to advance the public interest. I, for one, am happy to be marshalled because, President Sparks, you have both the skills and the courage to restore Peter Cooper's vision for serving students and inspiring truth. It is a giant responsibility, and we thank you for taking it on. It is wildly important to work and very timely. Now, my hope is that all of us in this room can work together 
just like my mother and I did with that red Toyota Tercel hatchback. With President Sparks in the driver's seat and all of us pushing from behind with engagement, with honesty, and a positive force, we can gain the momentum needed to restart Peter Cooper's incredible vision and continue down our path to a free Cooper Union. Thank you so much. Welcome to Rosa Adobe III. I'm a fourth year in the School of Art. What um, drew you to experiment with medium format photography? I started by doing archive work with everyone in this floor or in this building and I was just taking medium format portraits. My practice directly involves a quote-unquote community at large which are my friends, my family. So curation does seem like it's been a pretty significant part of your yeah. work, and I'm curious, what is it that has made curation such a central part of your work? The number one thing I noticed for myself and a lot of the people who looked like me was that there hasn't been or was not a space for our work to be made present in conversation with each other. I found it really, really important to make sure that there was some sort of designated space or exhibition that could exist for that because there just hasn't been a space. Why, you know? why do you think that is? I mean, you, you've created something extraordinary well, and it was in response to a problem that you identified. A lot of the exhibitions here are majorly representative of an identity that is not my own. Curation has been a means for me to show what they're thinking. They have tons of things to say. My mom always tells me to speak truth to power how do you garner the power to speak truth to power when it's hard? And in a, I mean, we're living in a time where truth is sometimes not readily available. My favorite kind of hero is the kind who's completely terrified the whole time, but does it because they know it needs to be done. And that almost drags you through being absolutely terrified. I think that a lot of that strength comes from when I think outside of myself. What's the one thing you want to make sure doesn't change? And what's the one thing you want to make sure does change? Oh, uh, gosh. Or if there was one thing Man. you could have changed about your experience. I'm going to add to your question, what would I have done if I was speaking to my younger self? I would have been like, yo, man, you're not alone. Please don't perform as if you are. Remember who your people are. And you're going to learn from that. Beautiful. Yeah. Beautiful. As Dean of the School of Art, I have the privilege of introducing Jeannie Matusami Ash, a graduate of the class of 1975. A photographer whose body of work is highly personal, yet speaks to the universal need for respect and purpose, Jeannie's images are, not, are notable for their ability to capture the dignity of her subjects, and that's true whether she's photographing members of her family or residents of the Dafuski Island the Gula community just off the South Carolina coast that she so memorably documented over the years. Jeannie also illustrated the dignity and the importance of knowing your history in her book, Viewfinders, the first ever written about black women photographers. 
Well known for her activism to protect the rights of people living with AIDS, Jeannie serves as director of the Author Ash Endowment for the Defeat of AIDS in honor of her late husband, the tennis and civil rights trailblazer. She is also founder of the Author Ash Learning Center, a nonprofit organization that provides a unique multimedia resource for understanding and promoting the legacy and values of Author Ash as a conscious leader, educator, athlete, and scholar. It is my pleasure to welcome Jeannie Matusi Ash. Good morning, and thank you, Dean Nussel, for that gracious introduction. Additionally, thank you to President Sparks, Rachel Warren, Dean Tarani, and Dean Stock. It is a pleasure, tremendous pleasure and honor to be here representing the School of Art for the inauguration of our 13th president, Laura Sparks. When I received this request, I began ruminating on Peter Cooper's intention to bestow the inspiration of truth and his instruction to pay its transforming influence forward in the world. Those words deeply resonated with me for as an artist, my job is to reveal the truth. There are always spaces of silence in culture. Part of an artist's work is to understand and probe those gaps, then pull forth meaning from those silences. Those meanings hold truths. At the same time, while putting my truth forward, I'm also trying to strike a chord that resonates beyond me, hopefully that connects with the observer. One of the functions of art is to help people recognize and connect to their own experience. To not see yourself represented in culture or in history is diminishing. It makes you feel unimportant or irrelevant. But when your experience is told, is visible, when it becomes a part of history, your truth is validated. Seeing your experience reflected back at you is empowering. By bringing people's histories to the fore, you give them recognition and recognize their worth. Good or bad, it happened, and it's history. Art is the tool I use to tell these histories. Perhaps James Baldwin said it best when he stated, an artist is a sort of emotional or spiritual historian. His role is to make you realize the doom and the glory of knowing who you are and what you are. A personal example of the inspiration of truth and one that coincidentally happens to demonstrate the amazing opportunities that Cooper Union has afforded me is the scholarship I received to travel second semester of my junior year. Most of my classmates went to Europe, but I chose to spend six months traveling in West Africa. The experience greatly expanded my horizons, seeing and meeting people living in a way so different from how I lived. But it also inspired me, specifically the Cape Coast in Ghana where the transatlantic slave trade took place. That area was all fishing villages, but there was also an old ruined castle, the Cape Coast, that had been a way station for the departing slave ships. Looking out of a porthole there toward the ocean, through the gap, and toward American shores and home. I thought about that journey from Africa to America, how there were fishing villages here on the west coast of Africa, and also fishing villages and communities on our southeastern seaboard. Right then, I felt the profound connection between those locations and knew that I wanted to research and explore the relationship between the two. That was the seed that beget my Defusti Island project. It began in 1977 and has continued as a part of my life to this day. Defusti Island is one of the sea islands off the coast of South Carolina and Georgia, which were inhabited by direct descendants of slaves. The people who lived there fished and harvested oysters, and because there was never a bridge to the mainland, 
were, and still not today, were somewhat isolated and able to retain more aspects of their African heritage. I repeatedly visited the island between 1977 and 1982, was welcomed into their community, and as a result, was able to produce a body of work offering my truth, displaying the beauty of their society and helping to share their story. Theirs was a unique slice of Americana, an important part of our history, and yet often unknown. Unfortunately, much of the community has disappeared now, making way for resorts, golf courses, and second homes. My photographs from Defusky Island not only fulfilled the inspiration that had arisen from my study abroad opportunity, but also tapped into that sense of responsibility that Cooper Union imparted to me. It meant that I recognized how important it is to tell those lesser known stories and to keep weaving the truths from those stories into the larger American tapestry. The responsibility also meant working to establish a scholarship fund for children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren of Defusky residents. My hope is that when people look at my photographs, they come away changed, feeling that they have learned something or have questioned it, or that their experience has been validated. To tell an experience that is history and history is storytelling. How we tell it is an art and an instrument of freedom. So you can see how that junior trip abroad has had a resounding and expansive impact on my work and my life. And this is also why when the family of Cooper Union alumnus Palmer Hayden contacted me sometime around 1999 or 2000 to help out with an initiative, I jumped right in. Believing travel to be so important to the experience of being an artist, Hayden had left a provision in his will to set up a revolving loan to fund study abroad experiences for students of color at Cooper Union. The family asked that I be the one to move the scholarship forward. My response was, I want to work on this, but let's not make it a loan. Let's make it a fellowship so students don't owe anything. The will set aside $10,500 to start the fund, and with that, I called a dozen friends who were arts supporters and said, I will put in $10,500, can you? And thanks to their generosity in the end, we raised $200,000 for the fellowship, and it continues to help students travel and experience the world to this day. Being able to graduate with the benefits of a full scholarship to this wonderful institution made a huge difference in my life. The founding idea that education should be as free as air and water is fundamental to the mission of the school. Being given the opportunity to have a free, excellent education conferred a sense of responsibility to pay that gift forward to other students other people, and greater society. It was a call to become more socially responsible. And it also suggested that like air and water, education should be a continuous part of your life. If I may share with you one more story. On my very first day in this foundation building, while curiously touring the halls of my new school, I stepped off the round elevator onto the eighth floor. A gentleman was walking out of an office to my right and asked me if I was lost or looking for something. I had no idea until he introduced himself that I was greeted by President Jack White. Apologizing if, 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 if I was in an area not intended for students, I told him I was a new student and I was just having a look around. He generously extended his hand and welcomed me, introducing himself well, hello, I am President Jack White. I was so stunned that he had to ask me my name. So I said, hello, my name is Jeannie Matusami, and it's my very first day. The expression on his face changed to a curious look, and he said, what did you say your last name was? I said it again, Matusami. 
He summoned me into his office to go through an old yearbook on his shelf as he wanted me to identify a photograph. He picked up a 1948 copy of the Illinois Institute of Technology yearbook and flipped through, flipped through the book to a photograph of a man. He asked, are you related to this gentleman? Stunned, I said, yes, that's my father. He said, young lady, I am responsible for your father attending the Illinois Institute of Technology on the GI Bill. <laughs> As a result, my dad studied with Mies van der Rohe and became a successful architect in the city of Chicago. All of this on my very first day. <laughs> to say I felt welcomed and exactly where I was supposed to be would be an understatement. I share this with you because it is a part of my story and the story of Cooper Union, for which I am so proud. As a final thought, I'd like to share a fundamental lesson about personal truth. When teaching photography, one of the first assignments I would give to my students was for them to take a photograph of a brown paper bag. Each student then return, would then return to class with their own interpretation of the brown paper bag. Comparing them side by side, they learned how uniquely they each saw a brown paper bag. I wanted them to recognize that they each had their own individual vision or idea when looking at something and to see how differently the same thing looks to others. Everyone sees differently. When we photograph, we speak our individual truth. That lesson was something I learned at Cooper Union from Gary Winogrand, and it has stuck with me. I am so proud and so grateful to be here, indulging in this opportunity to tell you about my truth and the good fortune that Cooper Union brought to me. It is a great pleasure to meet you, President Sparks, and recognize the unique and prodigious vision that she brings to this position. The history and the story of this institution will be forever altered by your work here. And to that I say, hallelujah, Cooper Union. <laughs> Thank you. freshman mechanical engineer. Yeah, I'm Courtney. I'm a chemical engineer and I'm also a first year. I'm Laura. I'm the president of Cooper Union. <laughs> <laughs> this was for our EID 101 class and we worked with Professor Cumberbatch. We designed the shelter to help refugees who are in transit in sub-Saharan Africa. The goal of the project was to build a shelter that would be rapidly assemblable, biodegradable, and portable. You know, over the years, I've done a lot of work with teams who focus on strategy and design and trying to solve problems. You can't design solutions just in an office or, in your case, in a lab or a classroom. I'm curious, if you couldn't get out and talk to refugees, um, what you did to either mimic that experience or guide you in some way. One of the things that we did was spend 36 hours living off of things that we could carry in a backpack, which meant sleeping on the floor. We also had to walk to Battery Park, and that was kind of to simulate what refugees have to do. So you are budding engineers, and in this case, you've picked a really important social problem, social challenge. Engineers have also created a lot of things that have caused damage in the world. What is it that you think about as you balance the potential implications 
for the projects that you work on? When we were designing this project, a huge part of it was that we wanted it to be biodegradable. Ultimately, we're trying to help people, and part of helping people is helping the environment they live in. And when this is hopefully produced in sub-Saharan Africa, the materials will be all locally available. As engineers, it's just really important for us to like always judge and re-look at what we've created so far and see how can we improve it and how can we make it more efficient. So what what prompted you to pick this project? EID 101 has just been like a really nice reminder that like the work that we're doing in our classes and all like the homework and all the problem sets <laughs> and all that are all pointing towards something in the future and it's all pointing toward helping people and really like having an impact on the world. I'm Richard Stock, I'm the Dean of Albert Noken School of Engineering, and I'm very pleased to introduce you to our next guest. He's Stephen Welby, uh, class of 1987. Stephen came to the Cooper Union with a deep curiosity about how technology works. At the same time, his parents, both immigrants, emphasized the importance of public service. Cooper Union gave him the opportunity to find answers to his questions while working with a group of highly talented faculty and colleagues across the disciplines. He came to value his own creative ideas and the importance of community to the success of a project. During his distinguished career, he served as the Assistant Secretary of Defense under the Obama administration. Currently, he is the Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, better known as the IEEE, the world's largest technical professional organization. Please welcome Stephen Welby back to the Cooper Union. Uh, Dean Stock, uh, Madam President, 30 years ago, uh, when I came to Cooper Union, I joined a community of makers and builders. And today I'd like to talk a little bit about the practice of engineering. If you were to take a survey about attitudes on the topic of engineering, you'd probably hear the profession described using words like analytical, or calculating, impersonal, and maybe even cold. But practitioners of engineering know that the reality is very different. Engineering is a deeply human activity with all the warmth, challenges, and complexity that any human activity involves. In fact, engineering in practice is often messy, emotional, and very personal. While it demands the application of science and math, it also demands courage, passion, joy, and commitment. In my time at Cooper, I learned not only the craft of engineering, but also the joy of engineering from lessons taught by faculty in the classroom, uh, from lessons taught through interaction with my fellow students, and from lessons learned in the great laboratory of this city in which this institution plays a vital part. It's been my privilege throughout my career to work with so many brilliant and inspiring engineers and technologists, men and women who strove to apply their technical talents for a greater good. Engineers are builders who seek to work with others to shape matter, energy, and information into useful forms, to design, test, and realize new constructions and new systems, all with the goal of improving the lives of those in their communities. If you look at the major challenges that face the world today, challenges such as the need to deliver clean food and water to a growing world population, the need to connect, communicate, and share ideas and knowledge globally, the need to provide Equi equitable health care and fight disease worldwide, the need to address the demands of aging infrastructure, the need to source clean energy and power. All of these challenges demand engineering solutions and engineering solutions at a global scale. We're in an era that will demand more from the engineering profession than ever before, an era that will require engineers to harness their creativity, ingenuity, and talent to do the work that matters. 
When I meet uh, young uh, engineering professionals, both here in the United States and around the world, I hear the same message. Young people are drawn to engineering because of the opportunity to do meaningful work, by the opportunity to have a real impact in their communities, and by the opportunity to help make the world a better place. Young engineers today want to grow beyond typical engineering roles and are demanding new ways to deploy their technical talents, forming virtual communities, pursuing entrepreneurial opportunities, and working to inform and shape policy and institutions. Young engineers are disrupting existing technical organizations and creating new ones. And this gives me great hope for the future of the engineering profession. This energy and excitement, this embrace of change, and the sense of hope for the future particularly embodies the young men and women sitting here at the Cooper Union. And the spirit extends into the faculty and staff and the core of alumni as well. Engineering as a field of human endeavor requires acceptance of certain core principles that ground and shape our technical disciplines. Engineers are committed to and accept that the world can be understood through empirical and measurable evidence, through theories and questions about this evidence, and are, that, uh, that they're subject to experimentation, that the fundamental principles that uh, ground our work can be observed through repeated testing, and that bodies of technical knowledge can be grown over time, building and extending the work of those who have come before us. Engineering in this way is really about a pursuit of fundamental truth. The techniques of engineering embrace the freedom to question and test, to dissent and challenge received wisdom, and to evaluate outcomes rationally with data. But engineering is more than science. Engineering embraces the structure and beauty of mathematics and the expansion of knowledge that science brings while focusing these arts on the creative act of building something that has not existed before. Engineering is a verb, and engineering is about action, and action creates change in the world. Unlike pure science, engineering intersects the technical and mathematical with human issues of ethics and economics, of choices about risk and benefit, and creates outcomes with impacts on stakeholders and the environment. When you ask an engineer to discuss a piece of novel and creative work, they rarely describe their work in technical terms. Instead, engineers often describe a piece of software as elegant, a flow design as graceful, or a mechanism as perfect for the task. These terms have particular meaning in context of the profession, but the choice of these words represents the inescapable questions of beauty and truth that are embedded in decisions we make about the engineering design of our man-made world. I'm an engineer, and I'm an engineering optimist. I believe that engineers have a great role to play in shaping the future of our communities, our nation, and our world. And through education and experience, I'm convinced that engineering is not a cold and sterile activity, but is instead a uniquely human one, an activity that brings to bear the technical arts in the struggle with what is known and what remains to be discovered, with issues of values and competing interests, and with the need to secure a better world for our communities and for future generations. I believe that decades to come are going to require even more from the engineering profession, and I am certain that the Cooper Union is helping to grow the talent and the leadership that will step up to these challenges and help shape our future. On behalf of my fellow engineering alumni, I want to extend our deepest regards, respect, and welcome uh, to President Sparks today on the occasion of her inauguration. Thank you. Commitment to honest dialogue, innovation, active learning, and public service. These are just some of the qualities that bring Laura Sparks to the presidency of this venerable institution. Speaking for all trustees, we have benefited from your strong and imaginative leadership, Laura, and we pledge to you, we pledge to you, our enthusiastic support in the demanding role you are called upon to play. As chair of the Board of Trustees, it is now my great honor to conduct the investiture of the 13th President of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art. Hey, hey Laura. <laughs> what you doing? 
come on up here to the Lincoln Lectern. <clears throat> By virtue of the authority vested in me as chair of the Board of Trustees, I hereby install you, Laura Sparks, as the 13th president of the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art, with all the rights and privileges of that office. As a symbol of your office, I present you with the Presidential Medal, charging you with the duty to fulfill the obligations of your office to the best of your ability. Now here's the part we didn't rehearse. Congratulations, Laura. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you, Rachel. I cannot overstate how important your leadership has been during this last year and how thankful I am to have your support literally on a daily basis. Whether it's preparing for a board meeting or talking through a challenging issue at any time, day or night, your heartfelt commitment to Cooper Union's well-being never ceases. Your determination to make Cooper the best it can be is a driving force behind our accomplishments. Thank you so much. <laughs> Trustees, representatives to the board, students, faculty, and staff, alumni, delegates, supporters, distinguished guests, dear friends and family, whether you are here with us in this remarkable great hall or watching from somewhere around the globe, I am incredibly honored by your presence and grateful for the confidence and the trust that you have placed in me, your president of the Cooper Union. While the title of your program reads the inauguration of Laura Sparks, <clears throat> as Rachel said, I have always envisioned this as a celebration of Cooper Union, our students, our alumni, our faculty, and staff. A time for us to reflect upon what our future holds and to do it together. I am inspired every single day by the creative expression and ingenuity I see here, by the boundaries broken and the challenges overcome, and by the way so many of you have stretched to work in entirely new ways throughout our first year together. A case in point is the team who seemingly willed this day to be. Along with all of the other events this week, I am so appreciative of your all-in collaboration. Your efforts have made this experience especially meaningful and memorable for me, for my family, and for the Cooper family at large. Um, I'd also like to offer a special thanks to the students who sang earlier this morning, to the students and faculty who shared their work in the videos we just saw, to those who contributed to the beautiful and powerful colonnade, and if you haven't seen it, I hope you'll take a minute to do it today. And to the three alumni who shared their thoughts with us a few moments ago. Jean, you are an extraordinary example of how fearlessness, resilience, entrepreneurial spirit, and an incredible drive to experiment can change a life and an industry for the better, just as Peter Cooper imagined. Stephen, your journey from Cooper Union through government and industry has brought you full circle to the kind of professional collaborations that bring to life the Cooper culture of finding new, multifaceted solutions to complex social problems. And Jeannie, your explorations of family, race, distant lands through your photography have enriched our lives. You have used light to illuminate darkness in ways that compel us to search for truth within ourselves. Through your art and your advocacy on behalf of AIDS and human rights and civil rights, 
you inspire us to do more to advance the human condition. It is an incredible honor that you would share this day with us in particular on the 25th anniversary of the passing of your husband, tennis star and civil rights advocate, Arthur Ashe. Thank you. Thank you all again. I'm so honored to have you here. So personal context defines so much of who we are and what we bring to our professional lives. It shapes how we see the world, how we interpret facts, the passion that we bring to particular issues, the truths that we seek. For many of us, it begins with family, and family is an incredibly strong part of my life. It begins with my immediate family and extends to distant relatives, my family of friends, and a number of other families of sorts that have played important roles in my life, from my days at Wellesley and Penn, to my professional life, and now to my Cooper Union family. This tapestry of relationships and experiences has shaped who I am and how I developed my view of America and of the world. My mother, Marilyn, is an American immigrant, born and raised in the Philippines, who emigrated to the United States with five of her siblings to pursue her career in nursing and search out greater opportunity. She comes from a long line of educators, including teachers, principals, professors, and deans. Her mother and her aunt started two colleges in the Philippines because they knew that education is a gateway to greater opportunity. My mother was my earliest teacher, and behind the scenes, she always and continues to be the glue that makes my work possible. My father, Stephen, was the only child of working class Jewish parents. Born in Washington State while my grandfather was in the army, he grew up in the Bronx and then Philadelphia. His grandmother defected from Russia at 16 years old, escaping Jewish persecution and landed in New York in 1908, just two years after the first class of Cooper's Institute of Technology graduated. She raised her three children in the Bronx, and exactly 50 years after she landed at Ellis Island, her granddaughter, my father's cousin, stood in line to take the entrance exam for the Cooper Union School of Engineering. From this lineage that has repeatedly juxtaposed poverty and wealth, political and religious disenfranchisement and liberation, and Eastern and Western cultures, I learned the importance of difference the commonalities that bind us, the importance of opportunity, and the hard work that transforms opportunity into a better life, the power of unconditional love, and the importance of working to make the world a better place. Like my parents, my incredible sister has always shown me how hard work and focus can lead to great things. She's a board-certified physician in four fields of medicine with a full practice and the mother of two, two young children, yet she still somehow manages to get six to eight hours of sleep a night. As many of you know, that is a feat I have yet to master. <laughs> and as I've grown older, I've increasingly realized that you can learn a lot from your younger sibling. My husband, Andrew, has been by my side through good times and bad for nearly 28 years. Do the math. Having known me for so long, he often has the ability to read my mind and put things into words before I even have the chance to do so. With his considerable expertise in education, his semi-tolerable sense of humor, <laughs> he has been an incredible partner in this Cooper Union project, offering so much to both me and to the school with little fanfare. I'd also re like to recognize his parents, Gil and Mimi Sparks, who have provided us with tremendous support throughout my entire career. His brother, Stephen, who has become my brother too, and his friend, Stephanie, who has become like an aunt to my children. And our children, the most important of all in the bunch. Casey and Haushan have been extremely patient with me during my time here at Cooper. They recognize that what I am doing here is important, 
and that there's a good reason for their sacrifices. Their continued love and support, their perseverance through tough times or difficult situations, and their positive views towards life and great senses of humor help keep me balanced and optimistic. While I don't have time to speak of every family member or friend here today, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you for all of your support. As you've seen today, I have also been so fortunate to have tremendous role models, advisors, and support systems within my academic and work families, and a number of them are here today. Mike Fitz and Wendell Pritchett both provided guidance and support to me in my early days and have become colleagues as I have ventured into the tall grasses of higher education. Mike, thank you so much for making the trip. It really means so much to me. <clears throat> I've also enjoyed tremendous support from my Wellesley College community. Many of them are here today including over the course of the last year as I have reimmersed myself in New York. From close college friends to an amazing alumni network to current and former faculty and administrators, Wellesley College has always been there as I've navigated through my career. It's wonderful that current President Paula Johnson could be with us last night, and Andrew Shannon, I thank you for being here today. So of course, as much as families support you and love you, they can also drive you crazy sometimes. <laughs> Love and family can be messy, whether it's your children needling each other from the back seat of the car, or spouses getting on each other's nerves after a long day of working or parenting, or as Cooper alumni Mike Essel and Kevin Slavin refer to themselves, brothers who passionately disagree on an issue. Yet these are natural byproducts of a healthy family life. Through disagreement and discord, life goes on. And most families find a way of going forward, even if it isn't always pretty. Our community was in turmoil just three years ago over the board's decision to charge tuition. Most thought we would never be able to return to full tuition scholarships. Many in our community protested, a lawsuit was filed, and the New York State Attorney General office intervened. Thank you for being here, John Oleski. Your deep understanding of the history of this institution and the promise it holds for our future has forced us to be true to ourselves and has pushed us to do the hard work necessary to make a vibrant Cooper future a reality. Despite that turbulence, our faculty, our staff, our board, and most importantly, our students persisted. You continued to learn, to teach, to do the critical work of this institution. And two years ago, the process of healing saw its first steps as people on opposite sides came together to begin working toward common ground. And this year, we have worked diligently and cooperatively to revise our school's mission and vision statements and to research and deliver recommendations to accelerate a return to free in 10 years this is progress, my friends. There is so much more work to do, and still many divergent views. That's to be expected. But I share this brief history to remind us of how far we've come. In three years' time, this community has moved from a period of pain turmoil and upheaval to the place where we are today, which in many ways feels like a brand new day. We are making real progress together, and we are demonstrating to each other the power of commitment, cooperation, and the search for common ground and shared purpose. If you attended last night's wonderful event here with the Aspen Institute and the Public Theater last night, you know that inauguration has been framed by the word truth. We chose this word <clears throat> because the search for various truths is a complex and critical task that lies at the heart of education and of institutional growth and personal growth. In some cases, truth might simply be the verification of a set of facts. In other cases, the search for truth 
is a painful endeavor forcing us to confront a dark past that would be easier to ignore, or the reality that an issue of great significance has no right or wrong answer, but rather a set of choices that are only better or worse, and that that definition of better or worse may depend entirely on one's subjective experiences. In all cases, the search for truth requires an intuitive reflection on oneself. It is my sincere hope for the Cooper Union that we can continually engage in this kind of deep and honest self-reflection and aspire to discover the truth in all of its complexity. That will require a relentless pursuit of facts and a willingness to understand that a multitude of personal experiences bring meaning to those facts. Does a collaborative search for the truth, for our truths, mean that we will agree on everything? Of course not. Will it be easy? No, it will not. It requires us to confront facts and perceptions and points of view that make us uncomfortable. In fact, we should strive for that discomfort, whether we're solving an internal Cooper problem or confronting the great scientific social, and political issues of our time. We are in the midst of extraordinary times. There is so much that is broken. And the deeply charged rhetoric that surrounds us, or that we may sometimes be part of, makes it too easy to quickly judge something as right or wrong, as true or false. Let us not fall into that trap. Let us lead by example in creating room to understand another point of view, to debate different principled perspectives, to use facts and evidence and compassion to arrive at a deeper understanding of the issues and of each other. That means moving beyond our own curated news feeds and networks, moving beyond our own hard-drawn lines in the sand moving beyond the questioning of one's motives simply because the approach does not mirror our own, moving beyond ourselves to contribute and inspire to something better that is reflective of our shared purpose. Working together productively and diligently, it is my hope that we will address a number of issues in the immediate years ahead that will make Cooper Union even stronger, even more dynamic. First and foremost, it is my hope that we will not just maintain Cooper Union's current levels of academic excellence, but that we will push our own limits forward and take full advantage of our tremendous potential. Cooper Union's three schools have excelled individually, developing highly skilled engineers, architects, and artists, along with a myriad of other professionals who have tapped a way of thinking that they developed here to contribute to many other fields and disciplines. There is no doubt in my mind that this will continue as we continue to attract tremendous faculty in our core disciplines. <coughs> However, the emergence of digital technologies, new modes of communication, and a shrinking globe are changing the way we work, the way we learn, the way we create. The lines between disciplines and professions have blurred, and new ideas are emerging at the seams. The rise of artificial intelligence has engineering, philosophical, mathematical, and artistic implications. The plight of refugees can be considered and addressed through geopolitical, scientific, economic, and technological lenses. The design and construction of new buildings and structures now involve artistic and environmental considerations and incorporate new materials and technologies. Given our small size, and our unique combination of schools, the Cooper Union is well positioned to educate engineers, architects, artists, and future leaders who incorporate the humanities and sciences into their studies and engage in rigorous, groundbreaking, cross-disciplinary studies. Working with and learning from fellow students in other schools while honing one's own discipline will enable Cooper students to break new ground, take new chances, craft new approaches. This type of work is already happening in pockets at the Cooper Union, 
You saw it in the videos, on the colonnade, windows upstairs, and in your program book. Through cooperation, imagination, and creativity, I am confident that we can build upon this work and feed the creative spirits that are hungry for more of these opportunities. Next, the majority of Cooper Union Learning has, for much of its history, taken place within the walls of two buildings. The Cooper Union will be stronger if we open up those walls to create opportunities to learn and to contribute throughout New York City. New York is home to many of the world's finest arts organizations, technology startups, innovative corporations, and educational institutions. It is racially, economically, and culturally diverse, creating a city of exciting contrasts and hybrids. It is a place where many face educational, safety, and healthcare challenges in need of solutions. The city also faces some of the world's greatest transportation and infrastructure challenges and has a tremendous history of conquering these obstacles through amazing feats of engineering and architecture. By increasing our outreach, we can provide students with new learning opportunities that don't exist within the corners of our buildings, engaging with some of the most critical challenges facing the city and its residents. And with the support of faculty and staff, Cooper students can work to better understand these problems and to contribute to the solutions that will solve them. Lastly, from the day I was born, my life was ethnically and culturally diverse, bouncing between homemade Filipino meals, family seders, Indian celebrations with close family friends, all while attending schools that were primarily white. For me, this diversity of cultural experience and perspective has been a gift. From the earliest of ages, I saw how different races and cultures can coexist and how a world that includes and celebrates difference rather than excludes it can create something bigger and far richer than the sum of its parts. In order to live up to Peter Cooper's ideals and vision, Cooper Union should reflect the diversity of today's New York City and the working class for which this school was designed. In 1859, the working class of New York City was primarily European immigrants from countries such as Ireland, Italy, and the Ukraine. In fact, we think my great-grandmother's launch point may have been the Ukraine. These groups were kept at arm's length from a college education. Others lacked the money to attend school. Women lacked access to college. For blacks, almost no options existed in the city. The founding of the Cooper Union helped to change this, providing new opportunities to working class students, European immigrants, and women. But the composition of America and New York City has continued to change over the last 160 years, and we must keep pace. Our student body, our faculty, our staff, and our board of trustees should reflect the community and the country we seek to serve. The Cooper Union has done powerful things to open a high quality education to those who are hungry for it, who show tremendous potential for it, but who might otherwise have been shut out of it. Let us together reinvigorate that legacy as we aim to be a beacon that illuminates a path to greater opportunity and a greater society. The Cooper Union is a school of art, architecture, art, engineering, and the humanities. As we experience a resurgence of cities around the globe, and as remote rural communities encounter the possibility of connection to the broader world through technology, I can think of no better place than the Cooper Union to reimagine the ways in which people live, learn, travel, and build community. As the income and wealth divide widens and more and more people focus on professional training, while socio-political complexity calls for greater humanistic understanding, I can think of no better place than the Cooper Union to redefine the intersection of rigorous professional education and the liberal arts. And as the world struggles to find constructive language and productive platforms for reasoned and nuanced debate, that can advance positive social change, I can think of no better place than the Cooper Union to illuminate the challenges and give life to the solutions. 
From the beginning, the Cooper Union has been a place of public discourse, a place where movements have been born, a place where emerging leaders have found their voices, a place where coalitions have been built and mobilized to catalyze positive social change long before their beliefs were accepted by the mainstream. That is our history, and especially given our current context, I hope that together we can make it our future. These are big aspirations for the Cooper Union, but I know we can fulfill them because we have accomplished so much together already in just one year. In fact, if you've been wondering why I'm just getting inaugurated now, it's because we've been a little busy. <laughs> we have made some difficult changes early on to help right-size our financial model. We accomplished an exhaustive study that resulted in the recommendations I spoke of earlier to return to full tuition scholarships. We have re reawakened this great hall with powerful public programming. We launched a diversity and inclusion task force to examine these issues across all aspects of academics, student life, and operations. We've engaged our community in an extensive strategic planning process. We are changing our narrative, we're building momentum, and people are responding. In fact, I have the distinct pleasure this morning of officially announcing that the challenge grant established so generously by the estate of Irma Justina Weiss, a 1945 graduate of the Cooper Union School of Art, has been met in under four months, generating $8 million of new money for Cooper Union. <laughs> What is especially remarkable about the fact that we met that challenge is that Irma's challenge inspired more than 1,100 people to give to the Cooper Union. And we just learned that Cooper was awarded a $2 million grant from the IDC Foundation to increase our opportunities to work across disciplines. We are already demonstrating in tangible ways that we believe in our future and that others do too. I understand that a lot of this may feel like a heavy lift for a place as small in size as Cooper Union, but this has always been a place that has been small in size, yet giant in its thinking. Realizing big ideas, inspiring and nurturing revolutionary ideas, learning new things about ourselves and advancing our community, our city, our country and the world that's the story of the Cooper Union. In continuing this narrative, we will honor the achievements of our predecessors and forge a new future together. Thank you. I'm Mary Dwyer, student trustee, and I'm here with Gabriella Godlewski, or I'm waiting for Gabriella Godlewski. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I'm here with Gabriella Godlewski, a junior in civil engineering, to present a gift to Laura on behalf of the entire student body of the Cooper Union. This gift demonstrates how much we appreciate you and the time you have dedicated to us our school, and its future. A year ago, you stood on the floor in the Great Hall and introduced yourself to our community. Instead of taking the stage, you stood on the floor, making space for the students and faculty to either sit at your level or sit above you in the tiered seats of this hall. You asked us to call you Laura instead of President Sparks. 
and you eloquently championed the democratic ideals of our school's founder, poignantly capturing why so many of us care about Cooper Union and how you are going to perpetuate, cultivate, and spread that care every day in your position here. On that day, you placed the students, faculty, and alumni above you. You demonstrated a sense of intuition for our community and its history that we thought only people on the inside could grasp and you promised to responsibly return us to free tuition while improving our experiences and education along the way. We want to present you with this gift because we recognize how you have elevated our voices, how you understand us and what we want from our school, and how you have committed to those promises. Thank you so much, Laura Sparks. We are so lucky to have you. Okay, I know that we're running a little late. I only have 20 pages of thank yous. <laughs> so here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go through an annotatum, and if you don't hear your name, just know that you were on this piece of paper, and I did thank you personally and individually. <laughs> First, Mary and Gabby, thank you so much, and thank you to all our presenters. Thank you to our talented faculty, dedicated staff, alumni, and our impressive students. What many of you don't understand is that's why we're here. They inspire us every day. To the Board of Trustees, you have been by my side. Thank you so much. You are dedicated, committed, and engaged. I do need to acknowledge one trustee who's not with us that we lost last year, Adrian Yovanovitch. John Oleski mentioned him. He died in a tragic <coughs> accident, but Adrian's love and passion and commitment to Cooper Union remains with us today. I want to thank the team that brought today together. You'll see many of them wearing corsages. If you see them, uh, please do thank them personally. I do want to make a personal statement of thanks to my father, who's sitting in the audience. Uh, I am here uh, because I, I, John surprised me. I didn't realize this was volunteer. Um, <laughs> OK, but that's a lot of hours I've been putting in. Um, but actually, I'm here because of my father. He's a graduate, 1950 in electrical engineering. He loved Cooper Union, and it's in our blood. And so being able to steward the legacy of Peter Cooper, as well as the legacy of my father, is one of the greatest honors of my life, both to be a trustee and now to be a chair of your beloved Cooper Union. Uh, to Laura's family, uh, Andrew, Casey, Haushan, um, thank you. Thank you for your sacrifices that you've made. We know that a president's job is 24-7. We are so grateful for your patience and support, and we are so happy that you are part of the extended Cooper family. Everyone who is here today, thank you for sharing in the event. But finally, to Laura. First, thank you for your voice lasting until that last <laughs> sentence is just barely lasting. She's been sick this entire week of her inauguration. I think was had fever over the weekend, but didn't want to share that with anyone, had lost her voice twice, it came back just in the nick of time, but that's the stamina I was telling you about earlier. Um, I want to thank her personally as being such an excellent partner. She's taken on a challenge, and she has shown us incredible leadership during this period. I've come to view Laura's inauguration as the official start of Cooper Union's next chapter, the next chapter in a book. Our book, our guidebook, if you will, <laughs> that we are all writing together. And so I want to thank you and thank everyone. This has been the first time that we have really been able to celebrate something joyous, something together with the entire community, and it is so wonderful to be able to celebrate our new president. So one more round of applause, and then I'll go to logistics. <laughs>
Cooper Square Singers under the direction of conductor Amy Engelhardt. They have a fabulous performance in store for us. After the ceremony, Laura will head outside to conduct the traditional wreath laying in Peter Cooper Park in honor of our founder's 227th birthday. Laura will then meet us back inside for lunch, which you are all invited and encouraged to attend. It'll be both in the lobby of the Foundation Building and across the street at 41 Cooper Square. I ask that members of the audience please remain seated until the recessional has exited the Great Hall. I now declare this inauguration ceremony closed, so let's hear from the Cooper Square Singers. Thank you. I've seen minutes turn to hours, hours turn to years, and I've seen truth turn to power. I could tell you 